this came about um, this came about in part because of what was probably a chance meeting uh, at at ECOC. I think um, uh, uh, Eliza came up to me and, and asked if I'd be willing to do it. So uh, it's one of the benefits of attending uh, in-person conferences, I think. But uh, so I'm going to um, give this seminar on on co-packaging of optics, uh, in particular for high-performance computing and data centers. Um, and then throughout this talk, I'm going to kind of show the highlight the differences that now exist between uh, HPC and data centers. Uh, so the outline will be, uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, what are the driving forces for HPC and data centers, HPC being mostly driven by governments, data centers, uh, mostly driven by uh, Ethernet switches. I'll give some specific examples and then show how HPC is different from data center. Um, and then I, and with a focus on, on the optics for both of these. Uh, and then I'm going to go in and talk about uh, various packaging form factors um, for the, the two types of, of uh, machines. Um, uh, I'll start with high performance computing. Uh, high performance computing has been tracked by um, the uh, top 500.org uh, list, and, and this is their, um, their tracking over a um, uh, like almost a 30 year period now, 2023 would be a 30 year period. Um, and so uh, what they're plotting is they're plotting the performance of the, the number one machine, and then they're plotting the performance of the number 500 machine. Um, and we have a period here up to about 2008, where all of the high performance machines had no fiber optics in them whatsoever. And then starting with 2008, um, IBM started using fiber and they had the first petaflop machine. So this was the IBM Roadrunner. It had 40,000 uh, fibers. This was all Vixel based running at uh, five gigabits per second per fiber. Um, and then uh, as the years progress in what I'm calling the fiber error, um, the various number one machines kind of go in and out of using fiber, like uh, the Japanese K machine, um, that was all copper. Uh, but then, you know, it was followed by Blue Gene Q, Sequoia. Um, and then also I put in question marks some of the Chinese machines because they didn't really publish. We know they were using fiber optics, uh, but they didn't really publish clearly what it was. Um, Cray. Cray tends to use all copper, but they'll use fiber when they have a government sponsored program. Um, and then uh, lately, you know, we had the IBM Summit machine. Um, and then this year, we have some exascale machines, um, but I sort of put this in a double asterisk because, um, because of the tensions with China, um, the Chinese basically stopped reporting their high performance computing progress a number of years ago. So China actually might have gotten to exascale first. There's some people who think they did, uh, but we just don't know because of this tension. They, they just said, hey, we're not going to participate anymore. Um, HPC historically drove new optical technologies. It was the big, you know, sort of gorilla in the room for a while. Um, it was the first to deploy active optical cables, the first to deploy co-packaging. Um, it's primarily driven by governments. Um, this exponential, 25-year exponential trend is not uh, slowing down. And it's, uh, what you find for the IO is a mixture of InfiniBand, uh, Ethernet, and proprietary solutions. Um, a bit about InfiniBand. Um, InfiniBand has now a bunch of specifications uh, going all the way up to 400 gig. Um, I think the 200 gig and the 400 gig are still work in progress. Uh, a number of years ago, they stopped 
specifying the optical interface. So basically, InfiniBand specifies an electrical interface, and they use active optical cables. Most likely, those have VIXELs inside, but in, with an active optical cable, uh, anything could be inside. What makes InfiniBand popular is it has much lower latency than Ethernet, and that's very important for high-performance computing. Um, so Ethernet, I think the Ethernet roadmap is familiar to a lot of people, but um, uh, Ethernet right now has got 800 gig. Um, some people are probably even shipping 800 gig prototypes right now. Certainly 400 gig is shipping. They're working on 200 gigabit uh, electrical signaling. Uh, and of course, optics would follow that. Um, and then they, beyond 800G, there's a 1600G. Um, the, for Ethernet, it's sort of performance is paramount. Um, power consumption is, is not, has not traditionally been a very big consideration within the Ethernet space. I think now it's starting to be, um, but this is this is the roadmap, and and this roadmap seems to be going. It was going in factors of ten at one point, but now it's going in like factors of two. Um, so this is a big eye chart of all the different kind of Ethernet standards and Ethernet form factors, and um, I'm not expecting anybody to sort of take away anything from this other than what I want to point out is that it's a mixture of copper and VIXEL solutions. And then in this, this other space, there's a wide variety of technologies, directly modulated lasers, externally modulated lasers, silicon photonics, uh, lithium niobate, thin film lithium niobate. There's, there's other sorts of technologies now being sort of mixed into this space. Um, Ethernet has gone parallel while the electronics catches up and, and then primarily they switch back to serial. But there's a number of, of 16 lane, four lane, and, and, uh, and then multi-wavelength solutions in, in the single mode space. Ethernet, um, is somewhat driven by the, the merchant uh, switch silicon. Um, and uh, here's sort of a, a, a map of what the merchant uh, ethernet switch silicon is doing over time. But basically every two years, there's been a doubling of performance. So we're right now here in 2022 and Broadcom just released their 51 terabit Tomahawk 5 um, switch. Uh, certainly 25.6 has been shipping for a while now. People are working on the 100 terabit switch versions. Um, I've also plotted the power consumption and bandwidth on a log scale versus time. Um, they're both scaling uh, exponentially. And then, of course, what's concerning is the power consumption. I have drawn in sort of this dotted line, which is a um, uh, an estimate of like sort of the limit for air cooling a single chip module. Um, they've gone way past that, and so what you're going to see is a lot of water cooled systems now to handle these uh, high powers. Don't think I updated this chart, but maybe I did. Tomahawk 5 is a 700 watt solution. So maybe that's like one of these data points here. Um, the other thing that we're seeing in the sort of ethernet industry is um, the time it takes to develop a new CERTES is shortening. Um, and so, you know, 10 gig CERTES had sort of a a four gig, four year run, 25 gig CERTES, maybe a three year run, maybe similarly for the 50 gig CERTES. And now people are working on 100 gig CERTES. So um, right now in our time frame, we've got a mixture of probably 10, 25, 50, and 100. 
Um, and even people are working on 200 gig CERTES. Um, so things are, things are accelerating. Um, this is another chart I got from, from Andy uh, Bechtelstein at, at Arista. It's just another way of saying the same thing, that the time between these silicon switch speed uh, CERTES is, is growing shorter. Um, so at the same time, I wanna look at fiber cabling because you hear a lot about data centers. You know, data centers are now the sort of 800 pound gorilla in the room, driving a lot of, of specifications and in particular, you know, saying that, that their solutions need to be sort of 500 meters to 2000 meters. But we took a look at, at what they're actually ordering. Um, and the thing that's kind of striking, and these are sort of histograms of, of cable length um, in, in data centers, is that they're buying a lot of really, really short cables. Um, here's a histogram from one supplier uh, representing over 600,000 um, duplex and trunk cables, more than 10,000 kilometers of fiber, and 92% of these were all less than 28 meters. So, you know, asking for, you know, a single mode solution and then deploying it at 28 meters is probably not economical. Uh, I wouldn't say that all data center operators do that. There are some that, that will have a mixture of copper and multi-mode and single mode in the same data center. Um, and, and, and sort of what you hear them say in the press um, and where they place their purchase orders are, are, not, are not the same thing. Uh, so a lot of short cables still being uh, used in data centers. I need to talk about a couple of IBM uh, high performance uh, computing systems that did use optics. Um, this is our Blue Gene Q Sequoia system. Uh, it was number one in um, in 2012. So um, it's 10 years old, it would have been 10 years old, except it got decommissioned in 2020. And one thing I wanna say about high-performance computing is uh, every four years, you can get a machine that's about 10 times the performance at the same power that you sort of expended. And, and so, you know, to keep a machine running when you could get something 10 times faster uh, just doesn't, make economic sense. And I would say that this machine probably would have been decommissioned, you know, 2018 or, or so, but for, for other reasons, it was, it was kept running longer. It had an eight year life. Um, this machine had 620,000 uh, vixels and fibers. And here's a distribution of the fiber links. This is a picture of the entire machine uh, room, by the way, this is, I think, approximately 10 meters by 30 meters. Um, and, and this entire system was cabled up. The longest cable was 22, almost 23 meters. Um, we had a huge spike in cables at two meters. So this is also kind of a consequence of using a 5D uh, torus topology. Um, here's another example. Uh, this is our, our um, summit. Uh, IBM Summit system. Um, this was number one, uh, like in 2019, I guess 2018. Um, and uh, today it's dropped to number four, but its performance is, is a factor of eight behind the number one machine. Um, this was a 200 petaflop machine. It was water cooled. So you can see these pipes coming into these um, uh, copper uh, water heat spreaders. Um, it used uh, about 80,000 uh, vixels and multimode fiber. Um, this is the, the distribution of cable lengths. And what I'm showing in green are fiber cable lengths and then in red. So where is copper? Red is copper. So where everything that was two meters or less we did in copper, that's for cost reasons. Uh, originally we thought we could cable the entire system 
up with just 30 meter cables, but when it when actually reached the floor, we had to get some cables that were 50 meters. But the message here is, you know, a number one HPC system put together with, with very short cable lengths. And then moving past uh, IBM programs, um, we have the, uh, in the US, we have the Coral 2 program. And so the Frontier system, this is the current number one machine. Uh, it came online this year, it's 1.7 uh, exaflops. It's a combination of AMD CPUs and GPUs. It uses the Cray Slingshot Interconnect and it is water-cooled and it costs the government about $600 million. Um, Aurora is um, an Intel machine that is, I believe it's being assembled right now. It may power on in December of this year um, or, or very early next year. Uh, it's being installed at uh, Argonne National Labs. Um, and then El Capitan, uh, it's another AMD system uh, similar to the Frontier. Uh, it'll be greater than two exaflops and that'll come online uh, in 2023. Um, what I'm showing here is several of these have publicly publicly announced that they are water cooled. Um, and so just a, a statement about water. Um, this is from Alan Benner. Uh, but water cooling has a tremendous number of benefits. Um, one of the big benefits is that it's super quiet. If you've ever walked into a data center that's air cooled, you know you have to uh, put on ear protection. It's it's just it's dangerous because of the acoustic levels in these machine rooms. Uh, water is very quiet. Um, it takes up a lot less uh, space, um, and you can put like entire data centers or HPCs in very tiny rooms. Like you can tuck them away in a closet, for example. Um, the HPC community has been using water cooling for more than ten years now and data centers are, are slowly moving to water cooling. Um, I wanna talk about you know, the, the sort of challenges that HPC has, especially for uh, optical interconnects um, and, and going forward. We have this sort of rough rule, 15% rule, which says that our HPC customers are willing to pay 10 to 15% of the system cost on their interconnect. And so, you know, for a $400 million system, that means they'll spend 60 million on the interconnect. Um, and, and you can go through all the math and, and project where you need to be. But the bottom line is, um, you know, future optics need to, for HPC, need to be in sort of less than the 15 cent per gigabit range um, and even lower for 100 gigabit signaling. And right now, optics are sort of in the dollar per gigabit range. Um, and, and so that's, that's problematic for, for HPC systems uh, moving forward. Another sort of issue that HPC faces is um, power consumption. Um, so uh, most of these machines are built, you know, even Frontier um, that I showed you, They've got sort of a, a power envelope of, of sort of less than 30 megawatts. Um, and again, if you allocate 15% of that for the network, and then you make some assumptions uh, about scaling it forward, uh, what, what you get is that optical links will need to be a picojoule per bit. And today's commercial devices are, are sort of in the 10 picojoule per bit. Uh, range right now. So we're sort of um, we're at a sort of a disconnect uh, in energy as well as um, in cost. So let me talk about uh, optics now uh, packaging for uh, HPC and data center. Um, you know, what we see mostly in the industry today are, are pluggable optics. And so we've got a, a switch ASIC or it could be a processor. Um, and an optical module will be at the far end of the board, be externally pluggable. Um, there's Kobo that was sort of putting optical modules in the middle of the board that didn't really catch on. Um, Co-packaging is, is the main topic of this talk. And this is what a lot of people are working on is where we move the optics 
right onto the first level package. Beyond co-packaging, um, we see sort of optical switching. So companies like IBM and Google have had uh, research efforts into all optical switching. It's um, not a topic of this talk. Uh, so Kobo, um, the consortium for uh, onboard optics, uh, they came out with, um, so at the time Kobo was being worked on, people didn't think they could get much power into a pluggable module. They didn't think they could cool it. Um, they didn't think they could get the high speeds to it. And so they said, you know, as a compromise, we can put these modules out in the middle of the board and they can be larger and they can have higher power dissipation. Um, and, and so what they did is they came up with a, a rather large number of specifications for both eight and 16 lane and different power consumptions. The thinking was that coherent needed, coherent does need more power, but it needed to go into a larger module. Although now I will tell you that people have, are putting coherent into pluggables and, and the need for the for Kobo type modules has really gone way down. Um, and then I didn't have a chart on pluggables, but I just assume that the audience knows uh, about pluggables. Um, so let's talk about uh, co-packaging and, and why we're why why you should be interested in co-packaging and why we're interested in it. Um, this is primarily to increase bandwidth coming from the ASICs. So the packages for large ASICs are pin constrained. If you can take IO off the top of the package, um, you've basically broken uh, a constraint and you can get more bandwidth out of your ASIC. When you put the optics right next to your ASIC, um, it doesn't need all that electrical power. It doesn't need very high voltage swings that are needed to overcome like, 30 dB cable loss, you can re greatly reduce the um, power consumption by reducing the voltage swing, um, maybe even taking out some CDRs. Um, this is, you should get a reduction in cost from co-packaging because basically you're stripping down the optical uh, packages and you have uh, reduced function in the ICs. And then you can also, if you're gonna have less powerful IO cells, you can reduce your ASIC area. Reducing your ASIC area always increases your yield. Um, but instead of reducing the ASIC area, you might choose to use your extra area for other functions. So add more IO cells or add more memory hubs, uh, for example. Um, the other thing about co-packaging is it reduces uh, human handling. Um, we had a guy from uh, Microsoft say that the number one reliability problem that they had in data centers was human handling of pluggables. So all of our efforts to make lasers more reliable uh, kind of went to naught when the humans uh, break everything. And co-packaging somewhat relieves you of that. Um, from an electrical, the, the electrical interface is really important to understand uh, one aspect of co-packaging, and that's how you save uh, energy. And I'm just using this this fairly old chart from the uh, OIF on their 56 gig uh, uh, common electrical interface specs. But they had uh, five different specifications from ultra short reach to long reach. And, and um, VSR and long reach were sort of the two popular ones for ethernet. But if we use the ultra short reach, you know, sort of a two dB loss uh, interconnect as a baseline, uh, what I've done is, is I've sort of shown in red how the energy goes up for the various lengths. So as, as the loss of the electrical link goes up, the energy needed to overcome that loss goes up as well. And, and the power consumption uh, overall goes up. And so this is, you know, one way to illustrate the benefits of, of how co-packaging can reduce your energy if you're willing to get somebody to design a USR or an XSR interface for you. And that's that's a big if. A lot of people wanna do a one size fits all uh, chip 
And, and when they do that, they go for VSR or LR. So you don't quite get the benefits um, that you could get. Uh, another aspect of large ASIC packaging, and, and I try to show this down here. Um, here's a whole bunch of examples of single chip and dual chip and multi-chip uh, packages, um, chip scale packages. Um, even as the technology node is improving, um, and, and so the IC pad pitch is going down as the technology node improves, which means that the number of pads on the chip goes way up, um, but the number of pads on the package doesn't, doesn't go up that much. And so there's this sort of five to one ratio between pads on your IC and, and, and pads on your package. And so that's one issue. And that's where if you can sort of break this by taking IO off the top as well as off the bottom, uh, you can get some benefit there. So I'm um, going to talk about uh, an IBM system. Uh, it's called the Power 775. It's something we shipped in 2010. This is the very first system, very first commercial system to actually use co-packaging. You might get the impression um, that um, you know co-packaging is a new thing, but uh, it's not. It's it's over um, uh, 10 years old. Um, and um, so this drawer, uh, this is about one meter by 1.8 meters. It was water cooled. Uh, in the center, you had all your um, processors. On either side, we actually had water cooled dims. Um, so we packed the memory as tight as we could. And then we had these switch chips. Um, these were um, uh, uh, custom switch chips, and then we surrounded all these switch chips with optics. So I'll go uh, take a closer look at that. Um, so here's here's a blow up of our, our sort of switch ceramic. We had this large switch here, and we surrounded it uh, with 56 of these uh, optical modules that we co-developed with Avago. This was called the Micropod. These things were about nine millimeters on a side and, and we've got a sub millimeter gap um, in between them. So packed them very tightly. Um, we packed them so tight that the fibers had to exit at a slight angle. They couldn't exit um, uh, parallel to the, to the ceramic or they'd hit the module in front of it. Um, so we had all these stacked uh, fiber ribbons like this. Um, one thing I want to point out is even though we had socketed these things and put on a water cooling plate, these were not field replaceable. Um, and so our strategy, you know, if a lane went down, it was a fail in place strategy and we had a redundancy um, in, in all, of, all of our links, we had spare links. Uh, in 2010, we bought about half a million of these and we did drive the price down to a dollar per gigabit and sort of that's the first demonstration that that co-packaging can reduce the cost of uh, optics um excuse me yeah how much redundancy is required to meet the lifetime of this thing what uh, what is the expected lifetime and how much redundancy you need to cover that lifetime so these things uh I IBM systems are, a lot of times we look at 60,000 hour uh, power on uh, life. So that's that's six years. Other times we look at 10 years. We don't really look uh, beyond 10 years because um, beyond 10 years or even beyond six years, the technology as I showed before is moving so quickly, it's really obsolete by then. Uh, and, and it's not energy efficient to keep keep system like that powered on. Um, what we did, so we had um, we had these D-links. Uh, D-links were um, 10 channels wide, so they were 100 gigabit, but we implemented a D-link as uh, 12 wide. So basically a D-link had two spares. Um, LR links were half as wide. So an LR link uh, nominally was uh, five channels wide, but it was half of an optical module 
so it had one uh, spare lane. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where does the electronics sit relative to these? It it sits right here. Oh, the, the TIA you. and the driver are. Oh, oh, oh that, TIA but... for the optical modules. Yeah, uh, yeah. they're they're completely inside these things. Uh, don't know if I have a chart showing the breakout of that. Um, yeah, they're completely inside this this little thing, little nine by nine millimeter thing. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure if I have a chart showing how that broke out. What, one thing I want to talk about with LGAs, and this comes up a lot in co-packaging, the question is, do I socket or do I solder? Now, in this very first instant instantiation, we went with the socket. But the socket introduces a lot of problems. It introduces mechanical issues, introduces thermal issues. So, so here's our LGA for all of our optics. Um, the optical modules sit on here and then to get the heat out, we put what we call a saddle. So the saddle sat on top of the optics. So the heat came out of the optics through the sides. Uh, we had a first layer of thermal interface material we had a second layer of thermal interface material. We had this, a giant heat spreader, which has some initial springs for preloading the LGA on, onto this frame. Um, but this frame also had a giant LGA underneath it for all the electrical connections. So there's massive LGA underneath. And then we had the cold plate way up here on top of this preloaded thing with a third layer of thermal interface material and that actuated everything at once. So, so sockets might seem like a good idea, but they make the thermal path and the mounting uh, more challenging. As speeds go up, uh, sockets present a signal integrity um, issue as well. Um, I showed you that OIF chart on the various standards of USR, XSR, and VSR. And we had this very large ceramic substrate. It had 89 layers. Um, and our switch ASIC was mounted here, but only six of our modules could sort of meet the USR spec. The bulk of them were XSR. And then the corner ones, they were far enough away um, some of them were six centimeters away. So this is, I'm showing you like a straight line, four centimeter distance, but, but when you route it out um, and you go through all the different layers, it ended up with like six centimeters. So it's very tricky uh, to meet a USR specification or even an XSR specification on, on large laminates when you, when you finally sit down and route things out. Um, I'm going to sort of switch gears here now and talk about um, the project I'm working on in research. Uh, it's a government sponsored project by Depart US Department of Energy, their um, advanced research projects agency energy uh, part. Um, and this is work that uh, IBM has teamed up with 2.6. And if you followed the news, 2.6 acquired Coherent and decided to change their name. Uh, to coherent, but it's really uh, it's two six finisar. Um, so so motion is a co packaging project, and you know one of the reasons IBM is interested in it is we feel that co packaging can alleviate a lot of bandwidth bottlenecks. Um, so I kind of already talked about. Um, this one here, where optics on this next to the CPU or GPU can get you um, higher bandwidth, um, but also co-packaging up into uh, ethernet switches uh, can enable higher rate of switches, give you a flatter network. Um, and then you can also disaggregate things uh, such as uh, memory uh, or connections to accelerators, for example. Uh, so a lot of good reasons for, for pursuing uh, co-packaged uh, optics. In particular, because IBM, IBM is a data center company, but we're also a server company. So we have a focus on um, doing co-packaging to uh, CPUs. Our program has 
uh, two phases. Phase one is, has been completed. Uh, it developed uh, this module, um, which was 56 gigabit NRZ, uh, error-free with, without FEC. Um, and, and one of the reasons why it has an NRZ interface is because CPUs and GPUs uh, still have NRZ interfaces and, and CPUs have yet to you know, even reach sort of 50 gigabit uh, NRZ signaling. Um, another reason for pursuing NRZ is, is we can be error-free without FEC. And so NRZ is much lower latency than, than uh, PAM4. Uh, one of the things that we're doing differently than, than the prior project that I showed you from 10 years ago is, is we're soldering now uh, onto the first level package. This sort of the feeling is that we could always fall back to sockets if we needed to. Um, soldering is a harder thing to do. We want to uh, work it out because uh, we feel that in the long run, this is the preferred solution. Um, because we're sponsored by ARPA-E, there's an energy goal, an aggressive energy goal, which was less than uh, four picojoules per bit. So let me go. So this is one where I actually have details on the package. Um, this whole package here is built up on a glass uh, substrate. We take our transmitter and receiver ICs, which are a, um, a CD by CMOS process. And we flip chip solder those to this glass along with um, 16 photodiodes and, well, 32 pixels. Um, there's a heat spreader, which we call the keel underneath. It carries the heat out to the sides to this copper heat spreader. Um, and then um, there's a first lens and then there's, there's a second lens here and some turning mirrors and a special ferrule that plugs in. Um, we, in this project, since we're teamed up with Finisar, uh, Finisar did a market study and it kind of came back with a funny result, which was, um, hey, IBM, you're the only company that's willing to do soldered. Uh, all the rest of our customers are, are too, too concerned to do about that and they'd like a socketed version. So we uh, we do have a way to, to build this part with both. Um, we can attach this interposer for soldering or we have this uh, spring set of removable springs for a socketed version. So we're, we're pursuing both. Um, our architecture is, is very simple. Uh, it's just basically bits in, bits out. There's no CDRs. It's, it's broadband. It can operate sort of from zero up to 56 um, gigabit NRZ. Uh, because we stripped a lot of stuff out, we have a nickname for these ICs. We call it safe, simplified analog front end. Um, it is 16 channels wide. It does have um, built in um, PRBS and uh, error detectors, um, and it operates uh, off of two power supplies, uh, 1.8 and 3.3. Um, some of the pushback that we got from our server uh, group is they only wanted it to be one power supply, and and I thought two was pretty good. The 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 reason we have two is we get a lot of power savings from using the 1.8. Um, uh, we need the 3.3 for the optics. But I also point out that the OIF CPO specifications have seven power supplies. So quite, quite different there. Um, here's a die photo of the a transmitter I see. It's about 1.6 by 4.6 uh, millimeters. The receiver photo looks very similar to this. Uh, here's a breakdown of, of the um, current draw from the various voltage domains. And, and you can see what I said, We've, we tucked a lot of function into the lowest voltage domain, um, and that helps us reduce the uh, energy consumption, which is quite important to us. Uh, the Vixels and photodiodes are, are designed by uh, Finisar, now coherent. Um, they're 940 nanometer Vixels. Um, and here's like a representative 56 gig I and 112 gig PAM4I. Um, 
we put down a raise of four, but actually what we're doing is we're putting down a raise of two by four for redundancy. And I'm gonna say something on the next slide, but basically in this project, um, because we're soldered and, and for other reasons, we actually have one for one laser sparing. Um, the photodiode looks like this. So there's a high speed portion with a very tiny photodiode. And then there's a monitor diode function, which is a, a larger in area. Um, so we did do a reliability calculation. Um, in this particular calculation, we looked out to a 10 year period. Um, our, our IBM server liked to have less than 200 ppm uh, at the end of 10 years. And so, you know, without sparing, there's no way we would get there. Um, but with sparing, uh, we can get to about 100 ppm at the end of 10 years. So you have a period here where uh, your fixed fit components are dominating and then laser wear out starts to kick in noticeably around five year time frame, And this is where your spares are helping you out. Um, and this is, this is how we implemented it. So um, I'd like to say it's the equivalent of having four spare tires in your trunk, right? You've got a spare for every, every tire. Um, one of the sort of uh, interesting things about this was, um, and we didn't think about it at the time, but our server group guys came back and said, hey, how quickly can you switch these spares? And we said, what do you mean? They said, well, can you get to hit list sparing? Like, like the system doesn't even know, you know, you're detecting that a laser is, is on its way out, you flick in the spare, and the system doesn't know. So we didn't design it for that, but we did characterize it. And what we found is right now it takes about hundred nanoseconds um, before you know you have an open eye over here and the eye is open again over here. Um, having looked at this, we realize you know one of the reasons for the the hundred nanosecond time was that all of the current sources for the spare channel um, needed to be charged up. They all had capacitors in there uh, for their current sources to stabilize them. And it took some time. So we feel like you could, in a different design, get to like a hitless sparing, but it wouldn't be necessarily a low power consumption point. Our phase two of this program. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so uh, at any given time, there's only light in half of the fibers, or somehow you couple light from two pixels into one fiber. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. Um, each pixel is coupled uh, into one fiber. Um, what's not shown here, or what's not mentioned here, um, these two devices actually have different polarization. And so we're actually using a polarization MUX. And with the polarization MUX, we can couple both uh, into one fiber. Mm. So yeah, so it, it wouldn't be economical to do separate fibers that way. Um, uh, what does a MUX look like for a multi-mode? It, it looks like a 45 degree um, turning mirror. Okay. It, it looks and is this. Um, so the polarization reflects off of, one polarization reflects off the first surface, the other polarization goes right through and hits the metal and reflects off the back surface. And they both mm -hmm. then travel into the same fiber. There's a lens that you're not seeing right here that's on the end of, of this. Excellent, thank you. So we're in the middle of our phase two right now. Um, and I just wanna highlight the differences what we're doing in phase two. Uh, we're doubling the number of channels, but we're not doubling the number of fibers. So, so basically keeping the number of fibers the same. So we're gonna do two wavelengths. Uh, we're also doubling the data rate. So to double the data rate, uh, we are going to PAM4 uh, to do that. Um, the uh, the government gave us a power another energy challenge as they said cut the energy down in half um, so now we're switching from SIGI to CMOS so we're using a five nanometer uh, CMOS node uh, to do that those are the primary differences 
Um, the other thing that's going on in our second phase is our IBM systems group is taking our phase one hardware and they're doing a technology evaluation on it. So basically they're mounting our phase one parts um, onto a server laminate. Uh, so this looks um, almost identical to an IBM processor laminate. Um, and they're going through all of the evaluations that they would normally do to qualify uh, an IBM uh, processor module. I'm sorry, would it be okay if I interrupt right now? Sure. I was just wondering if uh, multiple wavelengths is used for pixels and what are the challenges for that? Yeah, so, so there are products today um, using multiple wavelengths uh, for sure. Um, uh, there are ethernet parts uh, that use multiple wavelengths. Um, there are challenges in how, in the space it takes to do the multiplexer and the demultiplexer. Um, and, and I would say, be, if you look at the commercial parts, they're, they're quite a bit larger than what we're, what we're doing in co-packaging. So in principle, there's no challenge because you know, people are shipping product with two and, and four wavelengths. Um, uh, but, um, but to do it in co-packaging and to do it in the tiny space that we're doing it in, or we're attempting to do it in, um, that, is, um, that is challenging. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so here's another example. So this is an IBM sort of processor laminate without the heat spreader on it, uh, or internally we call it the lid. Uh, this is what it looks like when the lid is put on. Um, and then this is what it looks like when, um, when the fibers are inserted and they have some strain relief. Um, we are doing an experiment you know, this is an experiment like our Power 775, where the ribbons go one on top of the other. Um, you know, one advantage is that this takes up less space on this side, but the disadvantage is we've removed a lot of uh, heat spreader material uh, to do this. Um, and then another experiment, and the reason why we got two different directions is, I think ideally we would like our fibers to be sort of parallel um, even though we're water cooled, there's still air blowing in these systems for other components that are less power hungry, but still need air cooling. And we'd rather have our fibers parallel to airflow rather than perpendicular to it. I'm showing an example here of, of I think Senko put this together of a sort of a mock-up of a data center switch, but you know, with 16 modules using up all four sides, then you basically can't, of, you can't make your fibers all parallel to the airflow. Um, so that's, that's a concern. Um, and then we've done a lot of thermal mechanical modeling of this package. Um, you know, the question is when we add these optical modules to a processor laminate, do we do anything that affects the integrity of you know, the precious silicon, the processor silicon? Um, and what we find is the package does uh, warp a little bit, almost 200 microns in the center. Um, but when the lid is put on, that's flattened out. And this is considered acceptable uh, pre-warpage pre before the lid is put on. Um, we did run through, uh, completed a series of reliability tests. So these were tests to see if the integrity of the processor die was affected at all by the presence of the optical modules. It's different from reliability of the optical modules. And so what we found is basically the processor laminate, the processor was not affected um, up to a thousand hours of, of DTC. And then we started seeing some fails um, beyond a thousand, I didn't say a thousand hours, I meant a thousand cycles. Um, and then, so beyond a thousand cycles, that's actually acceptable because DTC is a highly accelerated test. Um, we've done some sort of system modeling to show the benefits of, of uh, using higher rated switches and co-packaging. 
uh, and we took a summit, we did an analysis of a summit like system with 600, 1620, 36 by 36 switches, and then compared it to another system that had 1280, 128 by 128 switches. And we find, you know, that was basically wired up uh, with co packaging. And we find that we can get sort of three times more network endpoints for 20% fewer switches, almost three times higher bisection bandwidth. Um, and you know, basically once you go into optics, you open up the path to direct uh, network attached accelerators. Um, in doing this modeling, we looked at different um, uh, traffic patterns. So here's just, I think, uh, four examples of traffic patterns that we looked at. Um, and we looked at throughput and, and delay. And so we're finding, uh, you know, in our co-packaging scenario, that there's benefits in both uh, throughput uh, and delay for the various uh, different types of, of traffic uh, that the calculations might um, uh, encounter. So, so some of the remaining uh, challenges uh, for co-packaging, uh, certainly reliability is always gonna be there. Um, there's a field replacement serviceability issue. Um, I would argue that once you go co-packaging, even if you're socketed, um, there's no way you're doing field replacement. Uh, if, if the people in your field are already breaking your pluggables, uh, you certainly don't want to expose them to or have your co-packaged optics is exposed to that. You would need sort of a um, higher skilled workforce. Uh, I just don't see it happening. I do see like a, a fail in place strategy is something worthwhile to pursue. Um, yield is always a yield and assembly together. You know, who's responsible at the end of the day for the final yield and who does what and when and where. Um, you know, IBM's approach to this has been to do uh, sort of all the assembly uh, in-house. So we have our IBM Bromont packaging facility and our server uh, manufacturing facility. Um, but if you don't have those, um, then I think it becomes, it becomes tricky. Um, so there are some standards and MSAs in the works right now. The OIF certainly is doing one. Um, but the minimum time for standards is, is at least two years, and we're likely to see proprietary solutions emerge first. Um, there is a question about compatible technologies. What I've been showing you is all multi-mode fiber. What a lot of the industry says that they want is single mode, um, although I'm hearing some you know, undercurrents of, of desiring multi-mode again. Um, and then, something that that optics vendors don't traditionally offer but it's very important especially uh, when you can't replace things is you need field upgradable firmware um, my i have yet to see optics firmware that was uh, bug free it's a couple examples of what other companies uh, are doing other than ibm so here's uh, something from japan uh, Japan has this uh, research organization called Petra, and then they spun out a company called AIO Core. Um, they're doing silicon photonics, um, co-packaged optics. They got a little tiny five millimeter by five millimeter transceiver, 100 gig, uh, but it's actually silicon photonics with multi-mode fiber. Uh, it's an interesting solution. Um, Rockley Photonics. So I showed this. I like to show this because actually, this package was was packaged for Rockley by IBM Bromont. Um, but if you've been following the news, uh, Rockley has exited the datacom business altogether, and they're pursuing uh, silicon photonic uh, wearables. Um, but um, anyway, I like to show this. It had 96 fibers. A 25 gig. It was a silicon photonics uh, co-packaged solution. Um, so Cisco showed this a number of years ago, uh, but the keyword here is mock-up. Um, I haven't seen anything from them since, uh, but, but the idea here uh, for them, if I zoom in on this, 
is that they would have like a switch ASIC and they'd have a photonic die with an electrical die mounted on top and they'd have a separable um, optical interface uh, kind of like this. Um, Broadcom, uh, so Broadcom's been doing some very recent work. Um, they've had some press releases. So this is stuff that came from their uh, OFC 2023 uh, booth um, where they have a common, they sort of wired up a 25 Terra switch with half of uh, co-packaged optics and half electrical. Um, as I showed you before, you know, these fibers, uh, you want to protect them against the wind, essentially. And so they very carefully have routed the cables under here. They've got external lasers. So what's going under underneath this cover is probably some splicing of the fibers that come from their external light sources uh, and then go back into their photonics. And then a ni nice, neat cable management solution here. Uh, this is a mock-up of what a 51 tera uh, switch might look like. Um, and then Intel's been doing some work in this space. Uh, they had a demo using a 12.8 tera switch uh, where they wired up um, four of their uh, sort of 400 gig uh, co-packaged optical modules. Um, I, I think, you know, it was surprising for me to see these, these heat pipes because it, you know, it's hard to say low energy when you have such a uh, intense uh, cooling solution. Um, but they had this uh, this demo uh, running uh, for a while. Um, so Facebook and Microsoft teamed up a couple of years ago to announce a big sort of MSA, if you will, or they put out a set of specifications that they called CPO. And that launched a whole bunch of activity. It got the uh, OIF working on uh, specifications. Um, and I think the OIF is actually almost completely done with their specifications, but uh, Facebook and Microsoft seem to have uh, lost interest in the project. It, it, it appears to be on hold and they've gone back to pluggable optics, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. I still think that a number of companies that worked on this are um, are still moving ahead with their plans, um, and and we'll see where that that goes. Uh, this is a duplicate of a slide I had before, so um, I want to talk about some competing alternatives to co-packaged optics, uh, and that's basically copper copper cable, and you know if you're working in optics, I, I would advise you to never underestimate the capabilities of, of copper cables. Um, and I will tell you in this industry that for every person like myself working on fiber optics, there's 10 engineers working on copper cable. And it doesn't matter how good you are, you can't compete with that level of, of resource. Uh, you're just out, out, out resourced. Um, but, um, so, so bringing copper off the top of a package, just the same way I described as bringing optics off the top um, is a competing uh, solution. Um, there's talk of bringing DC power to the top of the packages. A lot of the IO pins on the bottom of a package are devoted to power. Um, and, uh, and there's other things going on where they can make the high performance ASIC, you know, which is five nanometer going to three nanometer, going to two nanometer, they can just take the IO drivers out of it um, and use additional chips. So sort of like satellite surges, if you will. Um, and, and that's a way that they can sort of still have a large ASIC, but not have some of its area devoted to uh, IO. Um, so these there's some competing technologies out there. And Actually, it wouldn't surprise me, like I uh, showed you the Broadcom and the Intel uh, demos, if you will, but they were half optics, half copper. So, so in summary, uh, you know, I've tried to make the point that, that HPC and data centers requirements have sort of diverged a lot at this point. 
Uh, HPC systems are still put together with very short distance uh, links. They have a need for very low power and very low cost. Um, data centers are put together with short to long distance. Interconnect power to date has not been a primary consideration, but I think it's it's becoming a, a primary consideration. Um, we're still seeing Vixels and multi-mode fiber continue to have a large volume presence in both these uh, spaces. Um, and ethernet specifications are driving the data center industry, but in a manner that's not energy efficient or low latency. Um, I hope I've convinced you of the case for co-packaged optics that it, it supports bandwidth increases, it can lower power consumption and have a lot of sort of other packaging uh, benefits. Um, I do need to acknowledge my sponsor, RPE, and the roughly 100 people within IBM, Finisar, and Texas A&M University who are uh, contributing to the uh, motion project. And uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I would like to open it to uh, audience if they have any questions that they haven't asked throughout this talk. I do have a question in, uh, in general. Uh, when we put all this electronic and optics in the same package, what does the testing before putting it on the board look like? How do you make sure that the optics and the fiber and the electronics are all good? And what is the overall yield after doing all this? Yeah. Um you definitely need to have known good parts uh, going into this. Um, and, and I think what I didn't point out in, in what we're doing in IBM, um, I didn't point out that, that this, um, all five of these components are put down in a single um, soldering step. Um, and so basically we're not doing, so we have known good dye, we've got known good optics, we've got known good laminate, um, but we don't know that the whole thing is good until we build it. Um, I mean, it's a fair question. If, if we don't underfill, um, you can see the, the underfill here. Uh, don't think you can see the underfill around the optics, but you'll have to trust me, it's it's there. I think if you don't underfill, you have an opportunity to maybe do one one or two reworks. Uh, but I think once you underfill, you're, you're, that's it. Um, and, and so you really, um, you really need a high yield. Uh, you really need, um, processes that are that are not going to result in things like um, opens and shorts on all your solder joints and stuff and you need um, you know packages that are going to stand up to um, all the soldering operations it's not i don't want to trivialize this problem um, how how does the testing look like in the end though like uh, a machine plugs every fiber into the tester. Yeah, the yeah, that's right. I mean, you could do loopback testing on the optics or you could do uh, through testing uh, as well. Um, but um, that's that's a sort of in, in general what it would look like these. So, so for an IBM P series, the processor uh, module is a is a field replaceable unit and it is um, fully testable on its on its own. Uh, and so this would add a, another level of tests uh, for I see. the optics parts. I see. Another question, uh, in the figure you showed uh, with the TIAs and the PDs that there was a block diagram of the, all the area that you had there, is there any equalization? 
the which ones? The it was a sketch of the PDs in the PDs and pixels in the middle and the area of R axis and T axis on the oh, two sides. Oh, yeah, like that one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the, this one could work. So is there any equalization on the Rx or the Tx? Uh, yeah, present? yeah, no, yeah. there, there is. There's a very, um, there's, so for driving the Vixel, there's, uh, we've got, um, we've got three taps for driving the Vixel. Um, we do have a CTLE on the input of the um, transmitter. And then we have um, a very simple uh, uh, equalization on the output of the receiver die. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this equalization is good up to what speed? Well, it's, and it was what designed, length? It was mm -hmm. So the equalization is not to equalize out the fiber length. It's to equalize out the bandwidth of the Vixels and the photodiodes. Mm -hmm. um, so in the in the distances, so I showed you how HPC systems are sort of wired up with less than 50 meters. Um, we sort of targeted a 30 meter uh, link mm -hmm. for this technology. 30 meters of fiber has far more bandwidth than 56 uh, gigabit. Mm -hmm. So that's, we're not equalizing fiber, we're equalizing the, uh, um, the bandwidth of the Vixel and the photo mm -hmm. And these are typical OM4 fibers? It, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. If there are no other questions, I would like to thank our speaker for, for his time and this wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. And we wrap it up. Um, so the recording of this meeting will be available on our uh, YouTube channel if, for people to view later on. All right, thank you very okay. much. And everyone have a good evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye.